While by the 1970s, commercial breeder reactors had largely given way to conventional PWR and BWR designs, research into the technology nonetheless persisted. In 1983, the U.S. Department of Energy launched the Integral Fast Reactor, or IFR, program, which sought to address the major shortcomings of previous breeder designs. The basic elements of the system were tested using the Experimental Breeder Reactor, or EBR-2, built at the National Reactor Testing Station in Idaho in 1964. EBR-2 was broadly similar to previous liquid metal-cooled fast reactor designs, with a number of key improvements. The reactor was fueled by solid metallic uranium rather than conventional uranium dioxide ceramic, making fuel reprocessing easier. As the buildup of fission products caused the fuel to become progressively fractured and spongy, the fuel elements were partially filled with liquid sodium potassium, which flowed into voids in the fuel to maintain thermal conductivity between the fuel and the cladding. The fuel elements also incorporated an enlarged space to collect gaseous fission products such as Krypton-85 and prevent the cladding from expanding and cracking. The fuel was enriched to 67% uranium-235 and removed and reprocessed when it had reached 65%. EBR-2 featured a pool-type core, which not only allowed for greater thermal expansion of the core, a vital mechanism in achieving negative feedback and reactor stability, but provided a large thermal mass which guarded against overheating and meltdown. Experiments conducted in 1986 demonstrated EBR-2's inherent safety when even after the core and cooling system were shut down at full power, the reactor managed to cool itself via natural convection until the short-lived fission products had decayed away. The main innovation of the IFR system, however, was its reprocessing cycle, a combination thermochemical and electrochemical process. Upon the removal from the core, the fuel elements were declad and the uranium fuel cut into short lengths and placed in a crucible. The fuel was then mixed with a combination of barium, calcium, and magnesium chloride salts and heated to 1300 degrees Celsius. This initiated a replacement reaction wherein most of the fission products were absorbed by the salt. This slag was then poured off and the remaining metal purified via electrolysis, producing an ingot of uranium, plutonium, and other actinides that could then be cast into new fuel elements. The process was less labor and material intensive than the conventional Purex process, reducing the operating costs of the reactor. But its main advantage was in reducing the risk of nuclear proliferation. As the fuel was reprocessed on site instead of being sent to a central reprocessing facility, unauthorized diversion was less likely. The spent fuel also contained a larger proportion of isotopes such as plutonium-238 and plutonium-240, which had to be extracted before the plutonium could be used to build a nuclear weapon. Finally, the electro-refined fuel still contained a large amount of highly radioactive fission products, making it dangerous to handle outside of the specialized remote-controlled hot cell facilities of the power plant. Yet despite these advantages, the IFR project was cancelled by Congress in 1994 on the grounds that it still presented a proliferation risk. The cancellation came three years before the natural conclusion of the project, and at a cost greater than simply allowing the project to run to completion. One of the major factors affecting the commercial viability of breeder reactors is the labor-intensive process of removing, reprocessing, and reforming the spent fuel. This problem is largely mitigated by one of the more exotic reactor designs to be developed, the Molten Salt Reactor, or MSR. Instead of being formed into solid pins, the fuel in a molten salt reactor is dissolved in a mixture of molten fluoride salts, which doubles as the coolant. The core features a system of graphite moderator blocks designed such that the molten salt can only achieve criticality when contained within the core vessel. In an emergency, the salt can be drained into a sump of a different geometry which does not support criticality, terminating the reaction. Many designs feature a plug of solid salt between the core and sump. If the reactor overheats, the plug melts and the core drains into the sump. Molten salt reactors offer many of the same safety advantages as liquid metal cooled reactors in that the coolant system operates at ambient pressure, with the added advantage that fluoride salts are not flammable like sodium and potassium. But the main advantage of MSRs lies in the liquid state of the fuel, which allows it to be continuously tapped off and replaced without having to shut down the reactor. This process can be used to remove fission products, extract bread fuel and other radioisotopes, and even to add different types and enrichment levels of fuel in order to adjust the rate of reaction. Gaseous fission products also freely escape from the liquid salt, allowing them to be easily tapped off. This theoretically makes the reactor more flexible and cost-effective to operate, though it does not address the proliferation risk of extracting actinides from the fuel. Furthermore, fluoride salts are extremely corrosive, and the radioisotopes carried by the coolant inevitably contaminate every surface it comes into contact with, greatly increasing maintenance costs. 
The first molten salt reactor, the Aircraft Reactor Experiment, or ARE, was built at Oak Ridge National Laboratory in Tennessee as part of the Aircraft Nuclear Propulsion, or ANP, project, an effort to develop compact nuclear reactors to power long-range nuclear bombers. A thermal design moderated by beryllium oxide, the ARE produced 100 megawatt hours of thermal energy between November 9th and 12th, 1954. This was followed by the Pratt & Whitney Aircraft Reactor, or PWAR-1, which operated for several weeks in 1957. Following the cancellation of the ANP project in 1961, Oak Ridge continued MSR research with the Molten Salt Reactor Experiment, or MSRE, which first achieved criticality in 1965. The reactor operated for four years and was used to demonstrate the feasibility of a molten salt-based thorium breeder cycle. Further development was carried out starting in 1970 using Oak Ridge's Molten Salt Breeder Reactor, or MSBR, but this was cancelled in 1976 in favor of metal-cooled breeder reactor designs. This effectively brought MSR research in the United States to a halt. However, several companies are currently developing molten salt reactors as part of the Generation 4 reactor initiative. This includes Canada-based Terrestrial Energy, which is currently in the licensing process for its Integral Molten Salt Reactor, or IMSR. This is a small modular reactor, or SMR, design with a self-contained replaceable core capable of generating 190 megawatts. Unlike many previous MSR designs, the IMSR is a denatured salt design that operates purely as a burner reactor without any breeding capability. Also under development are the Danish Seborg Technologies 100 megawatt compact molten salt reactor and the Chinese TMSR LF1. Another reactor design which theoretically solves the problem of extracting and reprocessing the fuel is the Energy Multiplier Module, or EM Squared, currently under development by General Atomics. EM Squared is a gas-cooled fast breeder reactor which employs the convert and burn method, whereby a central kernel of highly enriched fuel is initially used to sustain the reaction and convert a surrounding fertile breeder blanket into fissile isotopes. This bred fuel is then burned in situ, with the reaction gradually spreading outwards from the kernel. The increased reactivity produced by the burning of newly bred fuel effectively cancels out the negative effect of accumulating fission products, keeping the core power output steady. The core is designed to produce 265 megawatts of power for a full 30 years before needing to be refueled, greatly reducing the proliferation risk posed by more frequent extraction and reprocessing cycles. Most of the reactors discussed thus far generate electricity via the Rankine steam turbine cycle, with heat being transferred from the liquid metal or salt coolant to a steam generator via heat exchanger. Higher efficiencies can be achieved by using the Brayton or gas turbine cycle. This requires that reactors operate at much higher outlet temperatures and be gas rather than liquid cooled. One of the few such designs to enter commercial use is the pebble bed reactor or PBR. PBR fuel elements, known as pebbles, consist of 7 cm diameter spheres of pyrolytic graphite, which acts as the neutron moderator. These contain thousands of 1 mm diameter tristructural isotropic, or TRISO, fuel particles, which are composed of a uranium oxide kernel surrounded by three layers of graphite and silicon dioxide ceramic, which prevent the particles from cracking and fission products from escaping at high temperatures. The pebbles are stacked in a core vessel of a specific geometry that allows the assembly to attain criticality. In an emergency, the pebbles can be drained into another vessel of subcritical geometry, terminating the reaction. This arrangement also allows spent pebbles to be removed and fresh pebbles to be added continuously without shutting off the reactor. A non-reactive coolant gas such as helium, carbon dioxide, or nitrogen flows through the gaps between the pebbles, absorbing heat from the reaction. Though the heat can be transferred to a secondary loop via heat exchanger, as coolants like helium have a low neutron absorption cross-section and are thus not easily contaminated, the coolant gas is often simply routed directly through the turbine. And as the gas exiting the turbine is still at a relatively high temperature, it can be used for industrial heating or cogeneration via secondary steam turbine or Stirling engine cycle. This combination of a Brayton cycle with a high inlet temperature and cogeneration capacity allows pebble bed reactors to achieve high energy conversion efficiencies of up to 50%. The chief advantage of pebble bed reactors, however, is their inherent safety. Like PWR and BWR fuel, TRISO fuel exhibits Doppler broadening, wherein the neutron absorption cross-section of uranium-238 increases with temperature, reducing the efficiency of the reaction. This creates a negative feedback loop, meaning that the reaction is self-regulating and can be throttled by simply varying the flow of coolant through the core. If coolant flow stops, the core will simply rise to a predetermined idling temperature and remain there, 
the high temperature materials in the pebbles preventing the fuel from cracking and leaking. Pebble beds thus do not need any active safety mechanisms, greatly reducing their complexity and cost. These advantages, however, are offset somewhat by the bulk and low density of the fuel pebbles compared to traditional reactor fuel, which increases storage volume requirements for spent fuel. The encapsulation of the fuel particles also makes extraction uneconomical, making pebble beds less well suited to breeder cycles. The pebble bed concept was first conceived by American chemist Farrington Daniels in the 1940s, allegedly inspired by the improvised Benghazi burner forced convection stoves used by British troops in the North African desert. However, the design was fully developed by German engineer Rudolf Schulten, who in 1959 directed the construction of the experimental 46-megawatt AVR reactor at the Hulick Research Center in North Rhine-Westphalia. The reactor first achieved criticality on August 26, 1966, and achieved a world record coolant outlet temperature of 850 degrees Celsius. Unfortunately, throughout its 22 years of operation, the reactor suffered a string of serious malfunctions and accidents, mainly related to the excessively high outlet temperatures. The pebbles proved less resilient than anticipated, resulting in the formation of large quantities of graphite dust heavily contaminated with cesium-137 and strontium-90. In 1978, a leak in the steam generator resulted in 30 tons of water contaminated with strontium-90 and tritium being released into the surrounding soil. On another occasion, the neutron reflector beneath the core suffered a large crack, in which some 200 pebbles became inextricably lodged. These and other incidents, as well as the 1986 Chernobyl accident, led to the AVR being shut down in 1988. Decommissioning has proven a long and expensive process, costing 600 million euro compared to the reactor's construction cost of only 180 million euro. A second pebble bed reactor, the THTR-300, was also constructed at the Hulick Research Center, first achieving criticality in 1983. The THTR-300 operated on a thorium breeder cycle and generated 300 megawatts for the German grid. Like the AVR, however, the THTR-300 suffered a string of mishaps, including a 1986 incident in which attempts to dislodge a stuck fuel pebble with compressed air led to radioactive dust being released into the environment through an open valve. Consequently, it was also shut down and decommissioned in 1988. The pebble bed technology was subsequently licensed to the South African Pebble Bed Modular Reactor, or PBMR, Company Limited, which began development of a 400 megawatt unit outside Cape Town in 1994. Despite early progress, funding gradually dwindled throughout the following decades and the project was indefinitely postponed in 2010. The only other country to develop pebble bed reactors is China, which began constructing the 10 megawatt HTR-10 demonstration reactor at Tsinghua University in 1995. The reactor, which first achieved criticality in 2000, formed the basis for the full-scale 210 megawatt HTRPM reactor currently under development. When completed, HTRPM will be the only commercial PBR and the first operating Generation 4 reactor in the world. Other Generation 4 reactors currently under development include the Very High Temperature Reactor, or VHTR, a thermal once-through design using either gas or molten salt coolant and a two-stage Brayton gas turbine generation cycle. The fuel consists of either PBR-style graphite pebbles or prismatic blocks integrated into the core itself. As with PBRs and MSRs, the chief advantage lies in achieving high turbine inlet temperatures, resulting in high thermal conversion efficiency. A variation on the MSR concept is the Dual Fluid Reactor, or DFR, developed by the German Institute for Solid State Nuclear Physics. This is essentially a molten salt reactor with the cooling provided by a separate liquid metal loop. This reduces contamination of the cooling system by the molten salt and allows for the construction of a more optimized, passively safe core, while the metal coolant provides more efficient thermal transfer. More conventional is the supercritical water-cooled reactor, or SCWR, which is similar to a regular boiling water reactor, or BWR, except that the water coolant is kept in a supercritical state, at which the difference between the liquid and gas phases becomes indistinguishable. This eliminates the need for much of the equipment required in PWR steam turbine systems, such as pressurizers, steam generators, and steam separators and dryers, allowing for a simpler, less expensive coolant loop. Supercritical water also has a lower neutron cross-section than regular water, resulting in a higher neutron economy and allowing for the use of unenriched uranium fuel or thermal breeder cycles without the need for expensive heavy water like in CANDU-style reactors. Despite all these developments, however, like all current nuclear power initiatives, the Generation 4 projects are highly susceptible to fluctuations in funding, public opinion, and the political climate. 
and completion and implementation dates are constantly in flux. It remains to be seen whether any of these advanced designs will end the nearly 70-year reign of the pressurized water and boiling water reactor.